on natural intelligence meets artificial intelligence, or in other words, what I announced as superintelligence in the beginning. And the speaker will be Harshal Kate. Harshal is at the Institute of Technology in Mumbai in India, but he is also working for the Ministry for Rural Development in India, and he has, he, he has a lot of interesting projects. We were talking about this in private, and I can only recommend to you, if you want to know more about this, talk to him directly. It's very interesting stuff that he's doing. Now, Harshal Kate, please. Thank you. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Dear ladies and gentlemen, my brothers and sisters. So today I'll be talking about the topic, machine intelligence meets human intelligence. So basically it's a speculative topic. We'll try to articulate that what, in what possible directions we are going when we are trying to come up with new advanced artificial intelligence. And uh, I'll be discussing with few examples, few stories. Uh, so let us see how we have developed so far. So since the civilization started, each and every individual had to cultivate its own food. And slowly with technology, with development, now these days most of us do not have to cultivate our own food. We just have to go to supermarket and we buy it. So in the background, there is a lot of technology that is there which helps us get things at a very, uh, in our own hand, with a very easily. And it's not just in agriculture, but in each and every field that we see technology coming and helping human beings and making our lives easy. So it's not just the, uh, the these tools basically are the mechanical tools, the mechanical muscle, which has reduced our human labor, and <laughs> which is why we have more time to specialize in one particular area. We don't have to spend time on all the hard, laborious work. We can become now specialized in engineering, in doctor, become a doctor, a lawyer. And this is how economic, economies have grown. This is how the standard of living of all of us have grown over time. So, before I start, I would like to start with a story. So once upon a time, in late 19th century, there was a really, really smart horse by name Stephen Ellen Musking. <coughs> so this horse was warning to his fellow horse that all these new mechanical machines, mechanical muscles, are one day going to replace us. And the other horse, in return as a reply, says, oh, come on. Do you remember all the hard work we had to do? Work for the day in the farms, uh, riding, go riding in the battles, all this terrible work. And now look at us, we have time for ourselves. We can enjoy, we can rest. And rest, you know what the situation today is. So exactly 100 years before, 1915, the population, we could find the maximum population of horses and since that year, the population has been decreasing. So now we will move on to the actual topic. So let us compare the intelligence or the capacities of humans with all other things we have. We have animals, so let us take dog for example, present day computers, and the sci-fi uh, AI systems which will be coming in future. So present-day computers and humans, and yes, the future systems would definitely have computational power and the knowledge of data, which animals do not have. Uh, animals do have emotional intelligence, capacity to infer, and social intelligence. Uh, well, however, the computers at present age do not have these abilities. Uh, also, in case of creativity, humans are a lot more creative than today's machines and animals. But whereas uh, we actually do not know what the super intelligence is going to be like, uh, well, how creative it would be, what kind of capacities it would have, but however, we definitely know that its computational power and knowledge of data would be far, far more superior than what we have. 
so development so far so till now whatever systems we humans have been trying to create uh, so these are basically one job is been given and the machine does that job very perfectly but when you ask the same machine to do something else it probably will not be able to do it but however with time we have we are coming up with uh, certain systems which are more organic which can do general purpose work uh, like today's computers are not just calculators but can also play music for you can play do simulations for you so we are moving in the direction where machines can do more than one work <laughs> so pre back in the day we just had translation systems with preset grammar however today there are systems which can learn new languages on its own and translate for you so the essential idea here is of bayesian agent which basically tells that it determines the first step is that it determines all the possible outcomes that there are possible in the next step and it also tries to find out what is the probability of the each and every step that is possible which makes it easier for it to predict the future uh, steps and accordingly it can take decisions so the problems that are faced by the current ai system are the first one is combinatorial explosion so to give an example if there is a game which has two possible uh, outcomes uh, two possible moves that i can make and in return my opponent for each move can make two uh, moves and in the third step for each of his moves i can make two moves and so on the length increases and the number of outcomes also increase so uh, for just with 10 steps the number of outcomes is going to be 1024 so if you increase the actual number of possible uh, steps in each step the next step is going to exponentially increase and it really becomes difficult for these ai systems to calculate uh, the data within the given amount of time so and also it does not have the ability to think or what exactly it has been doing uh, to i mean we humans have the ability to uh, come up with uh, ideas with a very short period of time with our intuition with our subconscious mind whereas these ai systems are not able to do so so far the third uh, problem which it faces is bounded rationality so every decision maker right now uh, has three limitations so these limitations are basically limited information uh, limited capacity to process information and limited amount of time we cannot have infinite amount of time to process this information so uh, these points will be discussed uh, will be uh, my friends will be discussing it in the next presentation so i'll move further so uh, kenemans distinction he has given us two types of systems the first system is more like uh, a human system which is really fast automatic frequent emotional stereotypical and subconscious whereas the second type of system it's it requires some operational uh, attention it requires that the system one should tell it how to perform so it is slow it is effortful logical calculating and ca con conscious so we can possibly argue that the current softwares the current ai systems are type system 2 uh, kind of uh, systems and they do not have the ability to perform a work on its own so the as an example uh, i would uh, talk about a situation so let us assume a swiss lady and uh, she is closed in a room uh, well all the ladies by the way i am a firm believer in feminism and i do not support the idea of locking into a room <laughs> but it's just an example so example is an example no reality in it uh, so uh, she has some chinese uh, mandarin letters with her and uh, on the other uh, side of the room there is another person who also has some chinese letters and this lady also has a guide book which explains her that you receive a letter from the other side of the door you compare it with the instructions given in the guide book and you follow the instructions and accordingly you pass on your letters to the person outside the room 
and she would do, do it very scrupulously without making any mistake. But the problem here is she has absolutely no idea, she has no conscious what exactly she is doing. She is doing the work, but she has no idea what exactly she is doing. And this is exactly how the current computers and AI systems are working. They do your job, but they have no idea what exactly they are doing. <coughs> so another example, the present situation which we have, uh, the DeepMind project of Google, and it has been very successful uh, in doing some kind of uh, work. Well, recently it was also successful in uh, beating the legend Lee Se Doll in the game of Go. So the leader of this project, Demis Habesis, tells us that we are really far, far away from the, uh, what, the kind of systems, the AIs we see in the movies like Matrix, uh, Transcendence, uh, Chappie. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so what exactly uh, they are trying to do is, they are trying to include more and more uh, human way of thinking into their AI systems. For example, if when we are driving, we actually do not uh, think of what is going to have, uh, what we are going to do five minutes uh, after this moment. We s look for what is right in front of us and we accordingly take decisions. In the similar fashion, these AI systems also do not calculate all the possible outcomes. They just calculate only uh, for the next few steps and then when they reach there, they calculate for next few steps and this is how they work. So uh, now we are trying to include more, more, more and more human way of thinking into these systems. Uh, so how possibly we can come up with such a super intelligent system which will be as good as humans? So the possible, maybe, I mean it's not sure, but possibly some may have argued that it may be with the combination of genetics, nanotechnology and robotics. So we have already done a very significant progress in these areas. Uh, we already have uh, uh, organs which can be transplanted, which are synthetically made into, uh, in the labs. Uh, we already have uh, made a significant progress in nanotechnology and robotics uh, with digital implants and uh, uh, nanobots which can correct your DNAs, uh, can save you from some diseases. And possibly the combination of these three things will lead to uh, forming of such a system which will be as smart as humans. <coughs> so if we compare uh, uh, the definition of this uh, SI given uh, as per the Nick, uh, as per the scientist Nick Bostrom from Oxford, he says that any intellect that radically outperforms humanity in all practical fields, which includes scientific creativity, social skills, general wisdom, is called as superintelligence. So it, it, he also says that such a system would be conscious, would be able to take decisions like we can with a subconscious mind. And in case this super intelligent system comes into existence, will it be superior to us or will it be still our, uh, under our control? It's still a question that needs to be addressed. So, so I mean, it's uh, really, I mean, we don't have any idea that what kind of goals such a system would have. Would it have common human goals like uh, passing out from a university, getting a good job, maybe presenting at the Academia Engelberg conference, or it would have some different goals of its own? Uh, well, some have possibly argued that it would have some instrumental goals, which are uh, secondary goals, general goals, and it would have the final, which is the primary goal, and it is really important if they have such goals that it is really important that we define these goals very clearly so that we can use such systems for the development of human beings and not, for become, I mean, not to become slaves of such a system. So if you consider smartness, so right now insects are somewhat smart. They can do some kind of job on their own with coordination. Then there are... Uh, animals like monkeys who can do a bit higher uh, complicated jobs and then there are humans who can do much much complex jobs and now we are trying to uh, come up with a system which would be equal in equal strength to human beings <coughs> 
And because we are able to make a system of its equal intelligence, that same system will also have the ability, the ability to come up with a system with more advanced uh, uh, powers, with more advanced capabilities, and it would go from one uh, level to another level without even letting us know about it. It would be so smart and it would be uh, really impossible for us to even imagine what possibly it can do. And uh, well, this is just one of the possible cases and we really need to prepare ourselves if such a uh, situation may arise because it's always better to go for prevention, prevention than to go for cure. Uh, so let us look at uh, the, I mean, if and if, uh, there, if such an explosion is going to happen, then we really need to see that how we can control it. And right now there are very less number of people uh, like Stephen Hawking, Elon Musking, and Rick Bostrom who are actually talking about that how we should control it, that what the possible negative outcomes of such a system can be. Whereas there are n number of companies, n number of uh, corporates which are actually trying to make such a system and they uh, argue that okay, this system is going to make our life easy. So now if we compare this situation with the first picture of two horses, and uh, uh, fortunately we know that the horse's name matches with the scientist we have, so possibly we should take this seriously and uh, think in the direction how to control it. So the risks uh, associated with the SI are that it is really difficult to anticipate what it is uh, going to do, how it will uh, behave, how it is going to affect our life. Uh, so it would be, I mean, uh, right now we are assuming that such a system would be just like human beings, it would care for each other, but it would really be a terrible mistake on our part if we compare it directly with the humans. To give an example, we have a bird and we have a F-22 Raptor. So we might possibly argue that both objects can fly, both consume energy to fly. But however, we know the difference that a bird can never harm a human being or any other animal. Uh, whereas F-22 Raptor can be used to bomb uh, cities, kill people, uh, harm the environment. So we really need to be aware that the super intelligent system is not exactly as a human intelligent system. Uh, and the other problem is, as I uh, talked, uh, spoke about it before, the final goal, we really have to define it what exactly its final goals should be. So I'll give two examples here. So if we have, uh, in the first case, the final goal of the system is protection of environment. And the secondary goal, the instrumental goal is protection of humans. And the system observes that, okay, these humans are create are the reason for pollution. They are making this uh, planet more and more polluted. Then in order to address its final, uh, its final goal, it would possibly start destroying human beings. But in the second case, if we set the final goals as protection of human and the instrumental goal as preservation of environment, then probably the system would understand that, okay, human beings are more important. And for human beings to survive, we need good environment. So it will take care of environment as well as the human beings. So we really need to be very, very careful when we define these goals <coughs> for our own benefit and for betterment of the future generations. So I'll give you an example that how this goal setting uh, uh, can be uh, very disastrous. So let us uh, consider there is a stamp collector who is also an AI uh, programmer. So with a very naive intention to collect more and more stamps, he comes up with an AI system. Uh, this system needs internet to pass on information and receive information. It would need certain internal model of reality which can make accurate predictions of what the possible outcomes are uh, for its current input. It would have some utility function and optimization to get the maximum possible output which it wants. So, uh, so what this AI would uh, do is, initially, I mean, it's just an example. So possibly it would just uh, first search on Amazon on websites like eBay that if I can buy these stamps for my master, it buys a few stamps uh, with, uh, from my account. 
then it possibly understands that, okay, there is no more money in my account, so it starts using my credit card. Uh, once the limit is reached, it starts using someone else's credit card. Uh, once that is reached, it understands, and the, all the stamps from these websites are over, it uh, possibly makes a fake website, uh, it writes emails to everyone in the world that, okay, we are going to start a museum and you should really contribute for this noble cause, and it would convince you to send your, all your stamps on so-and-so address, okay, but still my goals are not uh, fulfilled. So what next? Then I possibly hack each and every printer in the world and I force all the printers to print nothing but stamps, Okay, still not satisfied. I hack into the minting machines, the, uh, the, pre uh, the press which uh, prints currency, and it forces us all to chuck the currency and follow uh, the new currency, which is stamps. And that's how it ends up. <coughs> so this is how a very naive uh, goal can create a terrible, terrible things in future. So what the aftermaths uh, can be of such a system. Uh, so it would have access to a huge amount of data, uh, like already Google has, Google Maps have access to each and every movement uh, we make uh, every day. And this data is money for most of the companies. So if uh, this system lands up uh, into the banking, pharmacy, or secret services, uh, cartels like these, then it, and they would just use such system for profits of their own and do not care much about the human beings. And there would be too much of uh, snooping, too much of stalking in our personal lives, and then probably we would have more and more Edward uh, Snowdens, and then possibly we would have more number of asylum applications to the Swiss embassies around the world. Uh, and the first, uh, victim of such a system would be the developed nations, because in developed nations, everyone has access to mobile phones, to laptops, and uh, well, there are few nations in this world which do not allow their uh, citizens to use computers and are famous for all the notorious regions, and we definitely don't want to land up into a situation when a guy like this laughs at us saying, ha ha, now let us talk about freedom. <laughs> So will it actually replace the human beings? Will it actually happen? It's still a question which we have no idea about. But, uh, but I think still there would be, uh, the human intelligence would still be appreciated. I mean, come on, we would still pay hundreds of francs for a live concert of Led Zeppelin or Pink Floyd, rather than paying uh, for the trash EDM music. Uh, we would definitely uh, lose the most of the laborers' jobs. It is also said that uh, by the recent, uh, by the World Bank group president, that almost 20% of the world jobs would be lost because of automation. And this has already started. Uh, recently, Uber has started driverless cars in US, and we are losing these jobs. So how can we possibly control such a system? So the first thing possibly we think is, okay, uh, let me unplug the system. But now we, uh, as we all are aware that uh, we have cloud and everything. So it really is difficult for us to uh, control the system by unplugging it. It can easily multiply itself. Uh, the second thing is, okay, maybe build a cage, but really that doesn't work out. And by cage, I mean uh, firewall or protection. The third is, so let us not build it, but we, as we all know, we already have started taking steps in, the, in that particular direction. So let me give an example how we can control this. So we have two processes in physics. One is uncontrolled fission process, which is used for nuclear bombs and which is harmful for us human beings and the environment. And the other process is controlled fission, which gives us light, electricity, and benefits so many millions around the world. So the possible way which we can do uh, to control the superintelligent system is by controlling its ability to multiply itself. 
So just control its ability to multiply and then possibly we could take care of it. The other thing what we could do is increase transparency, ask the system to be as transparent as possible that whatever step it is taking, it needs to tell it to its uh, the, the people who are looking at the system that, okay, this is what I'm going to do next, this is what I'm going to do next. So possibly if we see that there is a threat, we can take corrective actions and we can save ourselves. So finally, I would like to say that it really doesn't matter who is creating this SI. We really need to teach this AI system to care for human beings, to care for the environment, so that we can use this for our benefit and for the benefit of the future generations. And we don't have a second chance in this, because as I said, the first system that would come into existence would be so smart and it would increase its capacity in a, such a small amount of time that it would not let the second system even come into existence. So it, we really have to be careful when we design the first system itself. And as I talked about the initial conditions, so we really have to be careful about the initial conditions. We need to teach it to prefer, uh, to care about our uh, preferences to our goals, and only then it will be of uh, help to us. And uh, finally, before I conclude my presentation, I would like to talk about, uh, I'd like to tell you a story. So when India was a British colony, uh, in northern region of India, there was a problem of snake bite, and lot many people uh, lost their lives because of this problem. So the uh, British rulers, they were serious about this, and they thought, okay, maybe I mean, we should definitely do something about this. And they came up with an idea that, uh, okay, we'll find, I mean, kill a snake and get us its head, and we would uh, then pay you a certain amount for it. And, this, and they thought that this is a perfect solution for the problem. People are getting money and snakes are getting killed every day. And snakes were getting killed every day, but however, uh, after a certain time, uh, six months, seven months, it was observed that instead of reducing the number, the number actually exponentially increased. And the British rulers got really surprised that how is this happening? Like it was supposed to address the problem, but it is increasing. And then when they did the research, they found out that these Indians were really smart. What they actually uh, thought was, if I kill the snake, I would get money once, and that's it. From tomorrow onwards, I'm not going to do anything. But if I start breeding this snake, I have more number of snakes, and I can kill each snake every day, and I have a constant source of income. And this is what actually happened. So we really need to take care of the possible outcomes. We really need to think beyond uh, the future, like what possible ways we can go in, and we need to address it now while we are uh, designing our policies, while we are designing our systems, so that we use the systems and uh, these policies for the benefit of the society and environment, and not uh, for our own destruction. Thank you. Thank you so much, Harshal. Beautiful. And of course, this is right into the middle of what happens today, as you all know, right? Um, you have questions, certainly, I think. Yes. Third row from behind. Thank you. Um, you said, like, creativity is the island of the mankind where computers maybe won't get better than we are. But isn't it like easy to imagine, for example, a computer that writes books um, on the base of data from all the books that have ever been written? And they might be just as well as all the others. And do you think like there's the one thing maybe called innovation that um, mankind does to create something really new, not just rebuilding what we already have that computers can't do at the moment? Uh, well, uh, well, right now, as you said, pointed out, yes, there are certain AI systems which can write poems, which can compose music at present. Uh, but s still, I mean, I, I have really no idea how these systems would work in future. 
but as I said, that these systems, if they come into existence, they would be so smart and they would multiply their intelligence at a very exponential at an exponential rate, and they would outsmart us and they would make us believe that okay, this is how it is sh it should be and not what you think. So the when they come up with the first system. I think that is the moment when our creative would, creativity would stop and this system would just rule us and they would be much more creative than what we are. Please, last, last row. As promised, my question is coming. Um, you were saying the system needs our data to survive because it, it, it analyzes the data and so on. And if it would be such a case, like in the matrix, you have the huge system that lives from your heartbeat, so to say, can't you just starve it? You just don't give it the information anymore. Because if it starts destroying you, you just make an island of people that don't use smartphones and don't use any other type of system that is connected to the big system. Of course, it can then take over the satellites and look where you are, but at the same time you would have smart people in your um, small city or whatever that would make it impossible to see what is under there and how many people there are. So can you starve the system? That's my question. Uh, well, as I gave the example of North Korea, that possibly that would be the most free state if such a system comes, that if people don't use computers and mobile phones, they would be safe. But however, really it is difficult to imagine uh, what exactly it would be like. And as you pointed out, with the satellites and everything, uh, you still can capture images, you can still find out how many number of people are there, what their locations are, what they are actually trying to do. Uh, it would be really difficult to anticipate uh, how exactly it would work and what possibly we can do to not land up into such a situation. And in a way, that, that's, I like that question because you know, the bell that it rings for me is uh, when, you, when you talked about the cobra effect, mm -hmm. of course, that is focused on how humans would behave. If you would try to play the cobra effect on the superintelligence, uh, just you know, breeding information or data which is completely useless or something, and then hitting it into the or, or plugging it into that system, that might be a kind of fun idea to play with. I'm not sure. They will they will recognize it, right? Yeah, they will figure it out how to yeah, do it. Yeah. Uh, I already there are U.S. Uh, there's a patent uh, which says that it is really easy for uh, the monitors which we are using right now. If you flicker it with certain frequencies. Mm -hmm. uh, it affects us emotionally, psychologically, and the way we think. So possibly if they could do it with any other, but not just monitors, with any other system, then they can also uh, control the way we think, the way our emotions run. Yes, sir. Please. Yeah, yeah or the, the, the microphone is in the back, but you will be next, right? You will be next. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, thank you for the presentation. I was wondering if you have some ideas about how realistic you think that is um, from two standpoints. The first one, the resources that we would need and the fact that we are already approaching the limits of um, Moore's law and that yeah, if we don't have another innovation there, we can't just go on with the multiplication of computational capability. And the second one being that you mentioned it doesn't matter who creates it. Well, I think it somewhat does because these people will be setting the goals and if um, the US, for example, see, oh, India is developing it, then maybe there will, there will be some preemptive strike to prevent that. Uh, for the uh, first question, uh, the most law that how it will multiply. So it has been. Uh, there are some estimations about it that when possibly such a system can come into existence. Uh, some say it would come in next 20, 25 years, and some say that it is really difficult. It would take at least 100 years uh, for a, such a system to come into existence. Uh, so right now we really don't have any idea how when this system would uh, is. Uh, 
would come into existence and recently elon musk gave a talk that it is also possible that we are right now in matrix kind of situation that our minds are already been controlled uh, how to think what to think what to question what not to question so it, it's really debatable uh, that whether it is possible not possible when it will happen whether it will happen in recent uh, future or it will take centuries uh, and uh, about the second question yes as you uh, pointed out uh, rightly that uh, we definitely do not want the bad guys to design such a system uh, we want uh, good people to design these systems and with good intentions with good motives uh, i guess that's true okay next question okay um, i just wonder what happens when the system starts to hack so the intelligent the super intelligence starts to hack its own system so we have this problem anyway in cyberspace so at a certain time i believe that we need to have the possibility as humans uh, to shut down the system maybe we have to have a parallel system which would completely lock the system down uh, i think we have here similar uh, with the cyber space with the uh, uh, viruses and all this uh, that are the danger uh, today we have a similar kind of challenge uh, either the system corrects itself improves itself and we have to be always to be able to shut it down uh, at least the sensitive structures uh, well so far as multiplying capacity and uh, able to i mean the possibility to shut it down we already have this cloud systems which are which are not physical assets it's something which is out there so in i mean in such a situation it is really difficult to completely shut down a system because it must have already uh, copied its softwares at multiple locations uh, without even uh, i mean making us aware of it and uh, and we also need to think uh, with a criminal mind like how possibly uh, these systems can work in a criminal uh, mind situation in order to come up with a counter uh, uh, solution for the same yes please when you have a super intelligence what happens to the humans when the neurons are not stimulated anymore and not challenged anymore is the average of intelligence decreasing and especially also for those who are less intelligent are they degrade even degrading more what do you expect well, uh, i would still say that uh, it would depend on individuals we still would have individuals would, would be free thinkers which uh, will definitely be creative uh, but it is also questionable that maybe these systems can hypnotize us and make us believe that okay you are free thinkers but it would make us be, uh, think in a way it wants us to uh, it in the way that system wants us to think so we really don't have any idea how this systems uh, would work and would force us to work maybe directly related to this um you, you had these numbers about 70% of the jobs in india and mm -hmm. china are threatened by possible developments of superintelligence right mm -hmm. Now, uh, my question would be, and that, that lines up to what you were saying, uh, does it also create new job opportunities? Uh, well, definitely, yes. Uh, like I gave the first example, horses, they had certain kind of jobs. Right now, they don't have these similar jobs, mm. but we still find horses with different purposes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At those times, there were no race courses. Now we have race courses. Uh, there were no these uh, we did they, at that point of time it was not a medium of entertainment but now uh, like yesterday i saw a carriage with horses in engelberg so maybe there would be different kind of jobs but definitely the number of these jobs is going to reduce it would not be the same amount as we have now so that's that's already the net calculation yes that's what you're saying yes You know, I'm going to my uh, to the customers department of my bank now for 10 years, and in 10 years I've seen the personal double. And when I, when I ask them, they say, so I ask them why why do, why do you hire new people every every other year? They say we need more people to talk to the customers like you 
who have concerns, who have complaints about the system errors that our system makes. So this is, <laughs> this is almost like fun, right? But uh, something like that seems, seems to be really happening, and not only with, with little banks, but with, on, on different levels. You need more and more people to take, uh, uh, um, to work on the complaints and, and concerns of customers who are misled or you know, mistaken by, by, uh, the, by, the, by the software of the, of, the, of the companies that actually are designed to serve them. Mm. I'm not sure about this. Uh, but you had a, fo you had a follow up question, um, sir? The, yeah, the microphone is coming, and then Gerd, you will be next. I think I have to be a little bit more precise. Let's say we have a nuclear station. Uh, uh, you have access through some way, uh, through uh, worms or whatever it is to the station. I think as long as we do not have a system that is, has a parallel system that we can shut it down with a secure system, which is not linked actually to the electronic part or to the cloud or whatever it is, as long as we will not be safe, we will have this problem in the future, I believe, for, for all the sensitive infrastructure. Well, possibly, we'll, we definitely, we humans definitely want such a system. We definitely want to control these SI systems. But as I said, we really do not know what actually is going to happen and how smart these systems are going to be. But we as humans definitely would want to control these systems. And we would definitely try to make sure that there are alternative ways to do it. And uh, we, all the scientists working in these areas, would definitely try to take precautions uh, to have these parallel systems to control each other. But we really do not know how things will work out. Because it's a, it's a I mean, articulative thing, speculative. I mean, we really do not have any idea what exactly it is going to be. So we just have to assume that, OK, these are possible number of outcomes that may have, that may happen and then accordingly take corrective actions right from now. Thank you very much for your lecture. Let me share two observations. The first one is uh, that I think that we will welcome all these systems. We will definitely welcome all these systems because we are greedy. Because we are greedy and since we are greasy, then greedy, then uh, the systems will sneak in over the economy. So that is uh, when I met Sun Microsystem at the Berlin uh, Vision A conference, they told me, uh, don't establish new uh, uh, places for, for medical students, because in 10 years we will every, everyone uh, replace, every doctor replaced by the iPhone. And then the cardiologist beside me said, they are still better in acute heart attack than I am or today in predicting it. Mm -hmm. And now comes the economy. If you look at Switzerland, we always uh, touch on, a, uh, uh, on the iPhone and we call the helicopter because we have uh, pretty much a uh, high level of services. 80% of the helicopter flights are not an acute heart attack. So you could save 80%. So that's simply in the statistic of the, of the, of the government. Uh, and that is where the system will sneak in, because then you get reduced rated in your reduced races, your re reduced rates, reduced fees in in your in your monthly uh, uh, payment for the for the insurance, and so on and so on. And there the system will sneak in. And what about the the, the, the people that cannot follow the the uh, the, the level uh, or the, the height of flight? The de-skilling effects we have already today. In North Carolina, we have the, the new uh, United Parcel Service uh, Logistics Center, and they offer seminars, obligatory seminars, to de-skill the workers in the logistics center. <laughs> because they have to learn, don't touch anything that computer tells you you should not touch. Just make sure that the address label is upright. That's your job. Of course, you are paid only 50% of, uh, of your monthly salary. Any, any reaction to this? Uh, well, yes, as you pointed out, we are greedy and we would like to make our lives easy and we would want these systems to be there. But as uh, uh, we pointed out with few examples, 
we need to also control few areas where we do not want such systems to be other areas of course we want our to reduce our human labor we want to make our lives easy we want to improve standard of living of everyone so for betterment yes of course we need such systems and that's all i could comment it's on. it's too bad that hartmut von saskia is not no longer here because he would as a theologian have something to say about greed as one of the fundamental sins <laughs> absolutely yes <laughs> Uh, there was another, yeah, there were two more people, you, you see them. Uh, thank you, I'm Lukas Schatwitzer from ETH Zurich. So, uh, thanks for your talk, but whenever there is this discussion on super intelligence, I always say people standing in the front telling me how super dangerous it is and that it will kill me and that it will happen probably tomorrow or in 30 years. Well, that's, sorry, but that's a bit juvenile. I mean, there has to be a benefit, otherwise nobody would do it, right? And it reminds me a bit of like the Victorian age when there were like scientists telling you that uh, the human body is physically not capable of traveling faster than 30 kilometers an hour or something, and that we are definitely gonna die. So it can't be that there is only downsides. I mean, it's okay to discuss the risks, but for us to judge a risk, we also need to talk about the benefit. Because we cannot make a decision if we only think what could possibly go wrong and don't do it, because in that case, we're gonna die as well. Uh, well, uh, the idea was, as I pointed out, uh, with the diagram of uh, the weighing machine, there are already n number of companies and majority of the scientists are developing it. And yes, even I support the idea that we need systems which are going to help us out with in various different areas. But at the same time, we also need to be careful about the, uh, the negative consequences. So it's better to prevent these negative consequences than later uh, like experiencing the aftermath and then trying to rectify it. It's always better to prevent it rather than to cure it. Next one, right next to you. I think, uh, as far as I understand, there are two streams of arguments. One is the big brother argument. So these machines will so be so intelligent that they will control us. And the other one is more related to the brave new world, Aldous Huxley's argument that these machines will change the way we think. And you made this comment. And I think this would be a more realistic thing. And it uh, refers to what Gerd just said, that we, the way we make decisions and deal with each other will be influenced by the machines. So I, I wouldn't see it as realistic that these machines are so intelligent that we as humans are not relevant anymore uh, on, on the planet. Uh, I would see it as more realistic that the way we make decisions, and we observe this right now for experts, for example, so that when I say I'm an expert, I make the decision, others will say, no, we have these intelligence machines, they have, they have the algorithms, and they make this proposal for heart attack, uh, detection or whatever, uh, and then we will have to follow these m uh, decisions that come out from the machines. And I think this will be more the, the problems we have to face in the future in the next years. Uh, well, yes, uh, but the, the point till now we have come, we have taken millions of years for research. We started with the wheel, uh, then using a fire, and now we are here with really, really advanced technologies. But whereas this super intelligent system, which has equal capacity as human beings, would have access to all this information in a really small uh, period of time. So the time period in which it develops is really, really short as compared to what we humans have taken. So for, that's why the argument is that these systems would be accelerating its capacities at a much higher rate than we possibly can. So therefore, this can be argued that these systems would exponentially rise and take, and as any system, like we human beings want to always be at the apex, control things. Uh, so similar situ uh, situation, these systems with conscious mind or consciousness would want to take control of situations under its control. Next question goes over there. Hi, I'm XJ from Uni Zürich. 
This is the uh, second time I've heard Harshel's presentation, and it is as inspiring as the first time. My question is, let's say Siri passes the Turing test and takes over um, the customer service call-out center jobs in India. My question is, what is your stance on um, a base salary as social security? Well, Difficult I, one. <laughs> I, would you like to answer this? No, she asked you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'm against well, base salary without work. Well, Let well, me say uh, it that way. But you may, you well, may be... Well, I have been working with the Ministry of Rural Development, and like, this is my personal opinion. Well, I firmly believe that all the human beings should be given basic needs at free of cost, like basic education, uh, access to food, proper health care. Uh, but whereas if you want uh, your needs to be satisfied, then definitely you should work for it. And uh, well, you need to do some work and earn your money to satisfy your wants. But needs, so far as needs are concerned, they should be given for free to each and every citizen in this world. I see two more questions right there in the gray pullover. Yes, you got the microphone already. Yes. Um, just one remark to the first question we had about innovation. Um, I just finished my master in business innovation. And what you basically learn there is there is not just an entrepreneur sitting in his garage and then he has this one idea. And then, so what actually happens, we, we always got this number from 7,500 ideas, one um, disruptive innovation comes out. And in the, all these innovation processes, um, you create a lot of ideas and you test them and then you go ahead. And if you have an entrepreneur team, you, if you're really good, you can may test one idea a day. So what now happens is that Google has a lot, <laughs> just a completely different capacity. They can test much more ideas a day. And the more you can test, it's like if you try to get a password and you do a brute force attack, you just need enough uh, processing power and then you will get this password. And this is how innovation can happen very soon, done by a computer. I would wish you to comment on this. This was more like a commentary, right? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and then please pass the microphone over to the gentleman in the gray shirt. Thank you. Thank you. A oh, very interesting talk, and uh, well, one gets a little bit afraid of. But uh, when I think it over, we have been, you and we also here have been mainly be talking about software, in the general sense of them. Greediness is also software. Huh? <laughs> uh, that was a very good. But we also need, and even if the power, computation power increases, new machines have to be built by the machines themselves. There is hardware. Mm -hmm. And hardware is a much more difficult thing because it depends on resources, number one, material. We are in material world. It needs also equipment and additional things to produce it build it that has more time lag than just creating new software. And then is also the problem of the energy supply. Already nowadays, I don't know how much of the electric power worldwide is consumed by all kinds of, of uh, software things, communication, uh, all these, these uh, uh, clouds, they are, they are real. The clouds are real, after all. There, there needs to be a, a server behind or, or, or computer power behind in reality, made by silicon or whatever. That could be, finally, a help for us as human be beings to survive. I don't know, at least, could uh, force a little bit less speed in exponential growth? Uh, well, uh, so far as material uh, is concerned for, hard, uh, for hardware systems, as we have observed particularly in electronics, 
uh, initially we had triodes, uh, uh, non-solid uh, semiconductor devices, which were really huge in size. And now with the semiconductor devices, the size of these objects are reducing exponentially. Uh, we had a very big tri-state and now in a very small chip, we have millions and millions of transistors. Uh, so we are innovating uh, this area as well with, where with less material, quantity of material, we have more number of things that are operating. Also now a lot of innovation is going on in recycling these materials at uh, various stages. So uh, we really cannot uh, would like, I mean I really cannot uh, say it with uh, stress that whether it is possible or not. But certain innovation is happening in these areas as well. And so far as energy is concerned, we are developing uh, other alternative energy resources which are sustainable in nature, uh, like solar energy, uh, wind energy, which would possibly address the issues of uh, energy and can uh, sustain these systems. But it is debatable, yes. I've got, I've got two more questions on my list. Uh, one of them is, right, you are neighbor, if you have the microphone already, and then the last one will be Xenia in the front. Thank you. <laughs> the human brain takes about 20 watts of power. That's also about 20% of our energy we produce as humans. Now, there are efforts on the way to produce technology that picks up this fact. Now it's IBM, for instance, has a new chip design called Northgate, which is structured like a, a human brain with, with cells and synapses. Or you have other efforts like the cognitive, not cognitive, like quantum computing, which basically also needs very little energy. So the energy issue, I think, is not such a big issue. But the big issue to me, and I've done a lot of work in this area, and your speech is really good, the real issue is what do we want as human beings? I don't want to be a machine, but I might want a personal assistant a virtual personal assistant that handles a lot of things to make life easier. And if you look at the commercialization of what you're talking about, watch what Google is doing. For example, they now announce the handy. Well, why do they announce a handy? Because they won't control your device that is your virtual personal agent. But they also develop uh, computing power, which is based on quantum computing. And they're probably today the leader in this development. So Google is trying to have a consumer to a total customer experience for everything and decommercializing. And I think that's what we have to worry about. The power these companies get already half over our data, and that needs regulation. Thank you, and then the last question or commentary, Xenia, please. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Harsha, for the presentation. Um, we've been discussing about uh, uh, bad purposes of the AI and the negative, um, positive and negative, but you mentioned in the beginning it's important to define the goal, right, of the AI. Mm -hmm. But um, don't you think that uh, artificial intelligence would be so smart, will overcome and will define by itself goal that things fulfills itself? And the, the, I'm sorry, the second point I would like to ask is uh, uh, we as a human beings, we have a storage, our brain, that uh, keeps all the information and basically by destroying it, we're not existing anymore, only the, the physical part will uh, be staying. With artificial intelligence, we only, we can know what is the, the, the storage of the info, 
information that it's keeping, so it can be easily either destroyed if it's required, or can be controlled by having by knowing exactly the location of the storage of the information. Thank you. Yes. Uh, for the first uh, question, I mean, I would uh, keep it in such a way that. I mean, always the seed that you plant decides uh, which fruits uh, are going to come out of that plant. So possibly when we design such a system with the initial goals, the outcomes that would come would also be uh, the result of such uh, of initial setting of goals. Uh, and so far as the second uh, uh, question is concerned that uh, they have access to data and we do not have capacity to uh, maintain so much data in our brain, whereas systems can access data all over uh, the network. So, well, the, there are two counter arguments for this. One is that, yes, the system would possibly uh, manipulate all the data and make us believe that, okay, this is what is happening. There is also a uh, counter argument to this that the system itself would get confused that which data is real. Because right now on internet we have lot many theories which are real, which are contradictory, which are some theories are not true, uh, some fake ideas out there. So how will that system itself be able to decide that which possible idea is correct or it's wrong? So there are these counter arguments going on that maybe they can control all the information or maybe they themselves get confused that which information is actually true. Okay, so I think this is the good point to Harshal. Thank you once more, once again, for your presentation. Thank you.